Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Martin. I'm uh, a developer at OVH. Uh, it's a big cloud company, uh, international cloud company, in, uh, mostly famous in Europe. And I was a developer at Ubisoft before. Uh, and today I want to talk about an experience I had while I was a developer uh, about managing data and how data used to, usually it grows out of control. And so um, I'm going to talk about JSON, but it could be about any data structure language. Um, what we usually expect from JSON is, well, to present structured data. Um, here's a bunch of JSON, and uh, you usually know it, it has strings, it has numbers, it has arrays, dictionaries, uh, maybe <coughs> booleans, and that's it. Uh, Any time you want to make, you want to save some data that is not uh, in boost types, you need to put them, usually you put them in strings, and then you have some program to uh, uh, transform them later. Um, the issue with that is, for example, what if we want self-references? Um, usually it's done with IDs, so um, here I have a, um, I want my owner to be from a list of owners, so I create owners with IDs, and then I put an ID in the owner section, and uh, good luck to keep them in sync. Um, if you've worked with MongoDB, for example, uh, it's not made for relational stuff, and when you start doing relational stuff, because any time you want to do something, usually you have a relation sometimes that appears, So I guess it's data to uh, the number of max level ponies is, is, is not something complicated, but it's data. Um, and JSON actually cannot compute that. We, we need a program to uh, compute, uh, the, the, to fetch the number of ponies and see uh, which are max level. But the number of max level ponies shouldn't be something that um, you, you need to compute. It's just simple data. So um, JSON is not enough, and any data structures is not enough for um, any complex system. Uh, they fail at self-referencing, they fail at representing processes and computations. So it's 2019, what everyone does. Uh, let's add JavaScript to it. So this is some grant file I took from a random project on GitHub, but uh, most grant files look like this. It's, it's supposed to be um, a configuration file, but you use JavaScript because you need some computation at some point, and the file grows up into this big monster, um, and you, you don't handle it anymore. And uh, it happens to be the case with JavaScript, but uh, I've worked with Lua files for configuration, I've worked with uh, Python files, and most of the time they start doing stuff they shouldn't do, and um, grow out of control. So why is that? Uh, I'm going to quote Bill Cosper here. Uh, data structure is just a stupid programming language. Um, JSON, XML, HTML, CSS. Those are all stupid programming languages. When you try representing concepts with them, the abstraction leak, and we end up writing some abstraction layer by hand to handle this data. So, we, we should be able to use data structures that are smart. Uh, this is an example of something we do to make them less stupid. For example, CSS has no variables, so we create less. Uh, JavaScript cannot uh, handle itself. It has no meta system, so uh, we create Babel. Babel is an awesome project, by the way. Um, HTML, we have those kind of mustache templates. Um, but old languages also have their um, system to handle this limitation. Um, C has the preprocessor, C++ has templates, Python has meta classes. Nobody uses them, but they are here. They're here. C Sharp has reflection. Um, what if I told you there's a simpler way, there's a more personal way that adapts to your domain? It's called the DSL. So we saw a DSL just before uh, my talk. 
uh, domain-specific languages, they're, uh, they're an abstraction that becomes a language. And uh, you use DSLs all the time without knowing they are DSLs. For example, make files are DSLs, regular expressions, SQL, the Qt UI language, uh, any game engine language. Those are languages that represent data structures, complex data structures. I don't know, a, a monster in a game, a quest, something. Um, but they're not simply data. They're a bit more than data, and so we need a language for that. Um, because structured data will always be better expressed with a specific language for that domain than a generic data structure. So banking data, you need a banking language. Game data, you need a game language. Medical data, you need a medical language. Um, but I hear you say, isn't writing full language a bit excessive? Um, and I need to remember the, the first rule of computing, the first rule of uh, programming, abstraction leaks. Uh, it's what I call natural growth or organic growth. It's whatever you do, your data will always evolve and leak through the abstractions you create. Um, usually, what we do to prevent this is we call this middleware. It's the, the kind of software that we write to pipe data into something so that it works. Um, but Lisp programmers usually know how it goes there. Um, most of the time, those middlewares, they actually are uh, a badly written half implementation of Lisp. Deep inside somewhere, there's this Lisp hiding. Um, so I thought, why not using Lisp in the first place? And so I'm here to talk about um, my favorite Lisp, which is actually from the Scheme family. It's Racket. Uh, and it's a language-oriented programming language. So uh, you can check it out at racketlang.org. And so as it's a Lisp language, it allows writing itself by design. It understands itself. You, you can modify the compiler um, by, uh, by using the language. And so it's really good at uh, writing DSLs. Those are examples of DSLs that um, ship with Racket. Uh, there's language for slideshows which is the one I'm using right now for these slides. Uh, there's a racket for doing uh, UI interfaces. Scribble is for documentation. There's a language for edit editing videos. And there's a web server language. Anything you like. Because making a DSL in racket is like five lines. Those are the five lines that generate uh, a parser in racket. Very bit intimidating at first, but with just a small combination of racket features. And uh, you, you just put those lines into a file with the name of the language you want to create. And you got yourself a full reader, parser, expander, with all the standard functions from racket, which allows you to create a lot, of, um, a lot of languages. This is one of the languages I'm working on. It's called uh, Web Galaxy. It's based on the web server system. And um, as you can see, you kind of blur the frontier between what is code and what is data. Uh, in this case, uh, we got a, a response for, from the API. Uh, the, the, uh, the API uh, endpoint is Pony. It takes an ID, then it gets the Pony from the database, and then it returns HTML. So now we are writing HTML. And then a bit later, we're writing CSS. Then uh, a bit later, we're writing JavaScript. And so we don't care. Um, it's just you, using this list syntax called S expressions, you can write any kind of language um, in the same flow, in the, in the same code. Your, your code is your data. Your data is your code. You don't care. This is another example of a project I worked on. Uh, it's a simple file that um, you, you write your um, you write your emulator for, um, uh, you write the description for a processor, um, and it generates a full emulator from that description. So uh, this file is about 500 lines, I think. And 
it generates a full emulator for that processor. You just describe the registers, you just describe the, the status register, what the, what, what the means to interrupt, then all the operations, and you got yourself an emulator without writing any code. You just have the data presenting what the emulator is doing. Uh, this is another example used everywhere in the racket environment. Uh, it's called Scribble. It's the documentation language. It's kind of like Markdown or LaTeX. Uh, it's uh, really useful when you want to write um, more textual um, documentation. And you, you can add, there's like functions. You, you can open a function there, define a function, and uh, it generates some paragraphs, and it generates links to uh, other parts of the documentation and stuff. Um, so what I really want to focus on is um, usually your data structures are not enough for the problem you're trying to, to map. Uh, so in those times, we seek more abstraction. And for my, uh, from my point of view, I think DSLs are a very good way to express abstractions as languages. And it's, it happens that Racket is a really good language for writing languages. Um, by putting this middleway logic into a language, uh, you can make it evolve and fit your domain. You care about your language more than you care about a shady script in the, the uh, in some part of your, your system. You don't have to write ugly data transformation scripts ever again. It's, it's just the language is there to help you make the transformations. You don't have to write uh, some one-shot scripts to transform data into something else. And when you work in a team, uh, the, the documentation that describes, you, usually a, a, a script that, a script that modifies some data is in, has been written like for a one-shot thing. Uh, it has no documentation. But if you write the language, you, you have the language specification, you have the, the language description, and so you can provide your team with that documentation and um, make them learn how the language is working, and so they can um, uh, directly use it. Use it. Um, this afternoon at 5 p.m., uh, if you're interested in making languages, I'll be having a workshop uh, in an hour, about an hour. You can come and uh, create your language. And so uh, uh, in an hour, you, you get back home with your own language you can, you can use for whatever you, you want. So uh, if you like making languages, uh, then see you there. Uh, I think we got some time, so if you have any question. So the next speaker set up? Yeah. So those custom languages, they uh, not written in S expressions, right? They have whatever yeah. format. Yeah, you can, um, by default, the easiest way to make those kind of languages is using S expressions. But if you want, you can create a custom reader and then, uh, for example, Scribble. Uh, is not made with S expressions. Uh, you can have the um, yeah the syntax you want. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard by any chance of Excel and Tau3? Sorry. Have you heard by any chance of Excel and Tau3? Uh, nope, I don't know. Nobody has. <laughs> uh, same idea, but okay. with a parse tree that is slightly more complex than this, and so it's. Okay. Uh, do, do we need to repeat the question for the? Uh, yeah. Talk next year. Mm. Yeah, well, actually, I studied the talk and accepted, and then I'll get to the track. Yes. I mean, a bit like Haskell, I mean, the potential, the thing, the advantage of JSON, obviously, particularly if you go to a binary of JSON, is that you've got you know, really high performance, right? You can write a trivial parser, 
Um, okay, it, pretty bad. I mean, real, yeah. On a scheme of things, you know, I really like racket. I, mean, I really like high school, but mm -hmm. the performance you know, relative to writing a JSON file for SD, for example. Yeah, it's the, definitely. It's yeah, real. obviously. And in many cases, concept files are used for the core. Um, maybe I, I don't. I don't have a lot of experience with having to really um, uh, crunch data files at high speed. Uh, usually, I use data files for um, mapping to a specific domain, but yeah. So would it compl be complicated to be reactive like, like the language we had before? Um, Racket is uh, really good at being reactive like that. Um, mostly the, um, uh, the, there's an IDE that comes with Racket that is Dr. Racket, and it's, uh, it has allowed the language to evolve a lot into um, uh, interactivity. So, uh, for example, if you write a, la a custom language using Racket, it's automatically um, uh, auto-completed inside Dr. Racket, and the, the highlights, uh, the, the color highlighting is there, and uh, stuff like that. So, um, uh, for example, I, I didn't wrote the, the, um, uh, the presentation using Dr. Racket, but if you do, uh, you have some kind of interactive thing like uh, WYSIWYG system when you can uh, c create your, your slides uh, by clicking on it. And so uh, by, by using a language that allows itself to, that understands itself, you, you can usually make some interactivity easier than using another language. Yeah. Yeah, um, so Racket is really interesting for that because the, the typed version of Racket is actually a language uh, made with Racket. So uh, when you want types, you use typed Racket, and when you want, uh, you can write a program using just uh, the simple Racket and then add types later, for example. And you just have to change on uh, the, the first line of the file and say, now it's typed, and, and that's it. So any, la any language can become uh, typed using Racket. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Thanks.